There are a quite good exchange programs from Australia. Rotary run a very good exchange program um, overseas. We have, at the school I'm at, at least two or three European students a year on a Rotary exchange, and we send one or two students a year on a Rotary exchange. What sponsor is it? Rotary sponsor. So Rotary International are sponsors. Um, <coughs> and it's a pseudo-academic year. So usually the students are in their last year of school or the second last year of school. And typically Australian students finish the school and then go and do a year 13 in some of the um, European schools. But it, it's, from my experience, it works very well. Students really enjoy it. I can relate. I um, did one of these programs. It wasn't exactly Erasmus because Erasmus wasn't open at that stage, but I was studying at the University of Melbourne and the language school at the university had um, academic programs that sent you to European universities. And it was one of the best experiences of my life without fail. Um, learning a language I found also particularly difficult. I thought my German was relatively good until I actually sat in a lecture theatre and had no idea what they were talking about given the technical aspect of the language. Um, and this Adapting to bureaucracy, German bureaucracy is amazing. Um, coming from Australia, this notion of you know liberty and you don't have to you know you don't have to go register for anything. I remember having to register um, at the, the German Amt um, and sitting and having this lady ask me a whole lot of questions, half of which I had no idea what she was talking about. And then she said to me, because I had applied for a German passport, are you are you prepared to do your military service or your civil service and I was thinking, oh my god, I've come here to study for a year, I'm going to end up in a, in a civil <laughs> service somewhere in Bavaria. Um, but it, I, I found it to be um, yeah, an absolutely fantastic experience and sharing things then with the students that came back to Melbourne University. I find what you said about cosmopolitanism, it really rung true, I'm not that I'm terribly cosmopolitan, but there was a distinct group of us that went and they all shared 
I guess, characteristics. Um, you know, they all wanted to go, they were all very interested in and engaged in what was happening, not just in Australia, but overseas. And um, it was a really diverse ethnic group that went, um, given the fact that we were from a language school um, that weren't all just European languages. Um, and they all kind of shared this, this kind of wanting to understand a, a bit better about somewhere else in the world. Um, and it certainly has stayed with me. I'm a teacher in rural Western Australia, and I still think about those, those times in Berlin um, really fondly. It was also very different. It was, I had a lot of unexpected experiences. I was living in Kreuzberg in Berlin, and the first week I was there, I heard more Turkish than I heard German. Yeah. Um, and so those experiences, were, they were great as well. You know, that, that was an unexpected. And I just thought when you talk about multiculturalism or the, the, the way societies have become hybrid, to me that was the perfect example. It was unexpected. I was living in an apartment block where there were more Turkish families than there were German families. And it, it, Operated beautifully. No one blinked an eyelid. You know, and then I went off to university and I sat in a different lecture group. It was it was awesome like that. And it, it also relates to, to the article that I have completed for a book. This book is it's on inside the methods, research in migration mobility, and where I had actually to reflect on on, on my inside the position within the community and uh, how it's called. Changes me and uh, it makes me define certain areas, dismiss some other areas, and what kind of issues I encounter, what kind of questions I pose in my research. And how it informs my research and my life. I like the use of the word cosmopolitanism. I like the use of the word I, I like the use of the word cosmopolitanism as well, and I use it for some of my political prisoners, but also in a more recent book on Australian Bohemia, uh, looking at Bohemian uh, artists, writers, filmmakers, singers, as people with um, cosmopolitan capital that they either acquire through reading and, or, or more commonly through experience of crossing borders both within a nation, you know, by class or migrant groups or diasporas, or through their journeys. And I kind of like the idea increasingly that identity, our identity, well, we have multi-identities, that our identities are less about roots, R-O-O-T-S, which is the old white Australia idea and the German folk idea, this myth of romantic myth of the peasant, soil, racing, the soil that I mentioned before. We're less about that than our roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, the routes, and <laughs> our journeys that we pick up different things. And um, it's, it, we, we're created by those movements. And you mentioned Berlin and that experience, which is with you forever. And Crossing, we had a conference in Monash in December, uh, breaching borders. And we were as interested in all sorts of borders between academia, and, and journalism and that the world outside, uh, social class, gender, uh, but obviously the nation border. Uh, I think Australia is one of those countries that got particularly hung up on connecting race and borders. What Australia is profound, and um, we, in teaching undergraduates, who grow up with the multicultural political correctness. Uh, they have, we've almost, in a Stalinist way, taken out much mention of wild Australia, except to say those people in the past were bad or silly. In fact, liberal labour, 
progressive people totally supporting white Australia as the best thing you could do. We need to understand how that happened. Because it could, you know, these things happen again. It might not be the same, but we need to understand that. And we did have this border race or toxiny thing going on in this country, which was always, uh, it was policed, it had a bureaucracy, it was how we represented ourselves to the world from roughly 1900 into the late 60s, into the 60s. And it always had its discontents and it was always under pressure from the reality of Indigenous Australia and the migration of the 19th century and the migrations of refugees that kept coming, uh, you know, from wars and things. So, you know, in teaching Australian history, um, I, I think we need to be very candid about that cosmopolitan uh, earlier period, but also about why Australia with young people so they can kind of understand. And it ain't hard, we've got 200 years here to play with and a lot happened in the let alone and the indigenous thing. That sort of get back to school teaching, it's all part of the national curriculum. I hope it's done squarely, but getting back to that comment about where we go um, in terms of how we understand that multiculturalism, I think that roots R-O-U-T-S idea, idea and hybridisation are really important ones. I, 40 years ago, I went through the bulletin uh, in the 1890s, 1910, and, and to 1945. And I discovered that in 1880, underneath the bulletin's name, it said Australia for Australians. Meaning Australian natives who are not Aboriginals but Australian born British. Yeah. And then from about 1904 or 5, under it says Australian for the white man, and of course it was the British white man. And that, and after 1945 or 46, or after the Second World War, that line was dropped. And that was almost more dropped when he was editor. I, I thought he was responsible for that. No, it, uh, and for me that was lovely staging of the Australian world. It's really interesting how the Bohemians of the 1890s, 1880s, like Henry Lawson and Archibald, who in some sense is a cosmopolitan, in their nationalism get into this racial thing, which is socialist, republican, and white. And uh, it's a little funny trap that a lot of people around the world gradually fell into, and, and it was this idea of, oh, we don't have any peasants, could have picked on the average, how do we, it's these mo mobile Australian w workers of the bush, they become the bulk, and it marries with another thing, which is British race patriotism, of the higher class point of view. And they have these parallels in Germany, yeah. Yeah. before the first world. Um, you mentioned republicanism a couple of times. Do you think, given the fact that Australia is becoming an increasingly diverse nation, that there will be a, another push or another swing or another move to to creating a federal republic or creating a... I have an article on that. I think it's called Independent Australia <laughs> website, um, which I could send through to the Monash Europe Centre to distribute. Where I deal with that issue, I actually think the republic is the narrative way it means. Uh, they think it's a side order issue because they have a wacky idea of what a republic is. They think it's about a head of state. Yeah. A little part of it. It's about the rule of the public. It's about decolonising the constitution. Yeah, totally. But we never did it. We, well, we did all this great democratic stuff, but we still have a kind of system whereby people go from the centre and tell other people what to do. And at, I think we should elect public boards. I think we should do all sorts of things like the Americans do. And yes, it leads to corruption, but I'm from New South Wales. We've got corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and I, something smells rotten in the cops, police force in Victoria. So putting that aside, we need a, nar a new narrative, a, new, a treaty with the Aborigines, and a kind of way of moving forward, like they have in the Treaty of Waitangi. Zealand, but the Republic to me is a way that many things can be rejigged, particularly this anxiety about our sovereignty, whereby we pick on refugees 
they don't kind of, we're happy to outsource our airports. You know, the things that are actually really important in terms of sovereignty will, will sell off to anyone. And we go back to the race thing. You know, what colour, we were, you're the right colour. That's what we were quoted. You know, that's still there. Because what Australia probated several lifetimes, and I think that a cosmopolitan republic, for one of a better word, needs to be worked out, and it's not beyond the will of human beings to work, to change. Uh, um, but, you know, that's a whole other issue. And our constitution needs changing. It seems like the legacy of those people, those revolutionaries that came here, kind of ended at the state constitutions and didn't purvey our federal constitution. Except the federal constitution gave votes to everyone to win it yeah. and had uh, short parliaments. Some of their legacies there, but it didn't go the whole way. There's a great book called The Great Constitutional Swindle by Peter Boxman about why it didn't go the whole hog. And it's um, really interesting. In 1905, she said, Australia really took international political in the whole. We left it all to the world. It was so bad that Australia, for example, did not have Australian, Australian representatives in Washington. There was an age in New York after 1919, and I worked on his papers. Uh, and it was only after the Second World War that we got the diplomatic service. But it was unpatriotic to ask for diplomatic service because it would have been set up by somebody that came out of it. So all this international thing was left to the British. Therefore, the shock of the First World War started to first was back. Eva, can I just ask um, who may have a discussion for the whole day about this? Do you think that history or civic education should become a compulsory subject in Australia? Uh, why am I asking? When I came to Australia, I started tutoring at Melbourne University, the Oxford of the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> and, and we had a subject on democracy. 900 people enrolled in it. Crème de la crème of Australian youth. In one week, we covered the Chartist movement and how they came to Australia. You just said you teach them this in high schools. Believe it or not, nobody out of the 900 students knew that some revolutionaries with good ideas came to Australia and that your democracy is one of the earliest and one of the oldest democracies, modern democracies in the world, that your women had rights to vote half a century earlier than in France or communist countries or somewhere. How come? How could this be? Maybe I had students who had their choice not to have No, I history. agree with you. But there was the students awful. that take the course that I teach, but like they take it on a voluntary basis, it's not it's not forced upon them. It's so this compulsory in New South Wales. It is compulsory in New South Wales, but they actually don't necessarily listen at the age of fourteen or fifteen. Well, I hate to do this again. That's true. I hate to do this. I was in high school and I ended up teaching it. And it's also <laughs> <laughs> and it's also <laughs> and it's also <laughs> look at how many teachers you've got in the room we and how many teachers know. are actually out there. Yeah. And I think that's probably can tell you a whole bit. Okay. Maybe a whole bunch of teachers in here do teach that. But what about all the ones out there? I mean, well, it's a holiday, I don't have to do that. <laughs> no, no, that, that's exactly right. But what if they're the teachers who don't know this either? The teachers don't know everything. Or this example with Aboriginal studies. Why would you give a choice to a 14 year old not to study it? I, would, I come from a totalitarian country. I would send that student to the desert and. <laughs> 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 I don't support you. <laughs> Well, I mean, on the Victorian Bell's system for secondary schooling, that it's just civics and citizenships is, is supposed to be taught. So is history, so is geography. And a lot of times you have what's called a humanities class at year nine, year ten, and from our, from our school that sometimes you get two or three weeks to teach civics and citizenship. And you're, you know, you're feeling you're really good if you can get the kids to tell the difference between an MLA and an MLC, and you go, oh, geez, they know about the state parliament. So all of this other stuff is just icing on top of, of just just being a vote, basic citizen and knowing how to vote. Well, the system, citizen, system is... I'm, I'm kind of hoping the national curriculum, which we're all under at the moment, and we're moving towards it because this year is the first year that history has been compulsory up to year 10. Mm -hmm. And as a humanities faculty leader, it's really exciting to have a whole lot of history teachers who are just thrilled to bits about the fact that it's now compulsory. 
So I think it'll change, and I think it will change because of the national curriculum, provided that people don't cut corners and actually follow what we've been told to do. So I totally agree with that. Um, Australian history is not going to have its own little box. It's going to be, as Tony suggested, a transnational kind of focus that I'm concerned is going to be morphed by um, a, a, a bigger picture approach to historical inquiry. Oh, oh. I would, I would disagree. The National Curriculum is fairly explicit in what you have to teach with regard to Australian history. I would say that there are, there are key areas of study that you must focus on. And so therefore I would think that... Um, I've had a, bit of, I had, had a bit to do with the, the history curriculum. Um, and I would say that there is certainly opportunity for history teachers in Australia to cover topics that in the past have well, one ignored. of the implications of the suggestion is that Australian history might be dropped at a senior level, at a year 12 level, from the curriculum as a result of this um, approach. Oh, yeah, that's yet to be, that's a long way off yet, that discussion about what the senior yeah, curriculum will be. I love that. Um, from from uh, my side, I was really encouraged to see that uh, my girls uh, who have twins, so they're eight years old, and one of them was encouraged so in primary school, to actually do a research topic on women's rights in Australia. Mm -hmm. So she knew it at, you know, mm -hmm. eight year age, you know, so that's really encouraging. And then Ms. Pratt told me that she's blessed uh, yeah, to be able to read a in this discussion anyway. Do you have anything more that you'd like to add? Um, maybe I'm just going to encourage her. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we, we point them to the library and explain what a library is, but you know, it's a school. Um, so, you know, I'm still trying to encourage them to read and explain what a library is. Um, but some reading and not set too much, and I think that's a really important to try and pick out some really interesting um, topic, um, papers that are not you know, too big for them to read. Um, and they get, get a bit overwhelmed, I think, sometimes. Um, Thank you.